Hi everyone, my name is Jen. I am an author and a book reviewer and this is what I'm going to title another chaotic reading vlog in the sense that I have several things that I would like to mash together into one video. So please pull up a seat and join me. If you're watching this the day that it goes up, then happy Christmas Eve to you if you celebrate. Let me tell you my plans for this video. So I have a hefty stack of books here, new books, that I need to haul. So I would like to show you these new books that I've either been sent for review from publishers or have purchased myself. Then I would like to read two books. So we're gonna jump into a reading vlog segment that also involves making crumpets. And then I would like to do a bookish quiz with you at the end. I did this, I don't think it was last Christmas, I think it may have been the Christmas before and we all had a good time. At least, I think we all had a good time. You said that you enjoyed it, so I thought I would do another one, you know, this time. And you can play it on your own or you can play it with family members or friends or, or whatever. We'll get to that later on in the video. So that's what you can expect here. But let us begin with a book haul because that seems like a very good place to start. Let me begin by whizzing through a couple of books you may have seen in previous videos before getting on to the books that I haven't shown you at all before. So a couple of weeks ago I went to Foils and I bought two books, I bought two short story collections, Seven Empty Houses by Samantha Schweblin which is translated from the Spanish by Megan McDowell. I have been meaning to read this for so long, well actually not just this, I've been meaning to read Schweblin for so long, ever since Fever Dream came out. And for some reason, I have never picked up one of her books, which is ridiculous, because I know that her work is compared to Carmen Marie Machado, and also her book Little Eyes was very like Black Mirror. These are all things that I enjoy. So that one is one that I bought, and then I also bought this, which I'd never seen or heard of before. It was a staff recommendation. This is Bad Dolls by Rachel Harrison. Four Dark Tales of Friendship, Heartbreak, Hauntings, and the Occasional Blood Sacrifice. I also recently did a video, just reaching behind me to grab these books, where I talked about some of my most anticipated 2024 releases, and I will link that in the description box down below. I think I talked about 30 books that are coming out next year, and I have four proofs of those here. The first one is a non-fiction book called Gathering Women of Colour on Nature, and this is a collection of uh, nature writing by women of colour. It includes work by Karani Baraka and Alicia P. Mohammed, who are both writers that I already know and love, and I'm hoping that I'm gonna discover other authors who I really enjoy in this too. This is coming out in February. Also coming out in February, in fact, maybe all of these are. We've got Butter by Asako Yuzuki, and this is translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton. This is based on a real life story, a woman who is in prison and has granted an interview to a journalist because she likes that the journalist is learning how to cook. She was a gourmet chef, and she has apparently murdered lots of businessmen, having seduced them with her home cooking, so yeah. That one sounds very intriguing. Then we've got Jonathan Abernathy, You Are Kind by Molly McGee. This is a humorous novel and it has been compared to the TV show Severance because it's about a man who gets a job that he could do in his sleep, in inverted commas. But I think it is too good to be true and I think it really messes with his head. And then we've got Hagstone by Sinead Gleason, which is about an artist who has gone to live on an island and then becomes involved in this group of women who live there. It says, wild, elemental, brimming with ideas and intelligence. Hagstone feels both ancient and very modern. A wonderfully surprising and totally original novel. The sea is steady for now. The land readies itself. What can be done with the women on the cliff? I'm getting Bass Rock vibes by Evie Wilde. So, those are the ones that I have mentioned briefly on this channel before. Now let me talk to you about books that I have never mentioned on here, I don't think. When I was recording my most anticipated releases video, I came across a writer called Gina Chung, and she has a new short story collection coming out. I think it's June 2024, which sounds really good. And I also looked at previous titles by her that have come out and discovered this book called Sea Change. And I decided in the meantime, while I wait for her new book to come out, I would purchase this and I love the cover of this. So this is Sea Change and this is what the blurb says, which is obviously what intrigued me to purchase it. 
Ro is heartbroken. Her long-term boyfriend has accepted a one-way ticket on a mission to colonize Mars. Her best friend, wrapped up in planning her own wedding, is too busy to notice. Her only consolation is Dolores, the magnificent giant Pacific octopus her father brought to Rose Aquarium before disappearing 15 years ago. Dolores can change into colours no one has ever seen before. She comes from the deepest part of the Bering Strait, where conditions are hostile to life. She is the only thing that connects Ro to her missing father. When the aquarium announces that Dolores is to be sold, Ro self-destructs. Wading through memories of her youth and with tough love from friends and family, she must come to terms with her own place in an ever-changing world. Shape-shifting, dazzling and perfectly observed, sea change is a story of finding yourself when your compass is thrown and making your own way back through the storm. So yeah, I thought that one sounded really good, so fingers crossed. And then I saw Claire Fuller, author Claire Fuller, recommend this thriller and I have been on the lookout for more thrillers recently. So this is The Night Visitor by Lucy Atkins. I hope to record a trying to find a new favourite thriller vlog in the next few weeks, months, fingers crossed. The blurb says, a high-flying TV presenter and historian, Olivia Sweetman, stands before an adoring crowd at the launch of her new bestseller. She can barely pretend to smile. Her life has spiralled into lies and if the truth comes out, she'll lose it all. Only one person knows what Olivia has done. Vivian Tester is a socially awkward housekeeper of a Sussex manor who has become Olivia's unofficial research assistant. But Vivian has secrets too. And as the relationship between the women grows more and more tangled, a bizarre act of violence changes everything. I'm intrigued. I purchased this anthology. This is Soul Jar, 31 Fantastic Tales by Disabled Authors, and it's edited by Annie Cull, with a foreword by Nicola Griffith. As you know, I'm always on the lookout for more books by disabled authors. This is a collection of science fiction fantasy short stories, which excites me very much. It includes stories that imagine wonders, such as a shapeshifter on a first date, skin that sprouts orchid buds, and a cereal box demon. I mean, that sounds wonderful. We have an insulin pump which diverts an undead mob, an autistic teen who sets out to discover the local cranberry bog sinister secret, and a pizza delivery on Mars that goes wrong. Another short story collection that I purchased recently is Ling Ma's short story. This is huge. I don't know why this book is quite so big, but I kind of find it endearing. It's gonna be easy to hold. That's nice, it's very floppy as well, because this is an Australian edition. This is Bliss Montage by Ling Ma. Ling Ma is the author of Severance, not any relation to the TV show, but if you are a fan of Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel and you haven't checked out Severance, I recommend you do so because I think that you would love it. And this is her collection of short stories. This is the very brief summary of three of the stories. On the back, it says, a woman lives in her house with her husband, her children, and all her ex-boyfriends. A toxic friendship is built around a shared experience, taking a drug that makes you invisible. An ancient ritual might, might heal you of anything if you bury yourself alive. I really enjoyed her writing in Severance and I've heard really good things about her short stories too. Then I have been sent a copy of this book here which is called Rural Hours. It's a non-fiction book. The finished cover looks like this because I have the proof right now. The finished one looks like this and this is The Country Lives of Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Townsend Warner and Rosamond Lehman. So it's by Harry Barker and the press release says that Harriet tells the story of three different women, each of whom moved to the countryside and were forever changed by it. We encounter them at quiet moments, pausing to look at an insect on the windowsill, jotting down a recipe or digging for potatoes, dirt beneath their nails. Slowly, we start to see transformations unfold. Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Townsend Warner and Rosamond Lehman emerge before us as the passionate visionary writers we know them to be. I thought that that sounded really interesting. Next, I was sent a copy of this from One World. This is Night Bloom by Peace Adzo Medi. And I haven't read their first novel, but I thought this one sounded brilliant. And I will correct myself on the screen here if I'm wrong, but I think this may be eligible for the Women's Prize. And I thought it could be a contender just going by the blurb. There's also a quote on the front from Huma Qureshi, who I absolutely adore, who says this is a blistering story. This is about two cousins, but it's more about the friendship between those cousins. So they were close when they were young. They grew up in the same Ghanaian town. They're called Selassie and, what is the other cousin called? 
a call fair. Um, so it says they're more than cousins, they are best friends. The girls share everything, whispered late night conversations and dreams for the future and secrets, but they then grow apart and then they meet again as adults. So Akorfa now works for an international develop in international development as she navigates the challenge of life as a black woman and a mother in the US. And Selassie is a successful restaurateur running the hottest spot in Accra. And when an incident at her restaurant puts Selassie in danger, the women must overcome their differences and face the truth of what happened all those years ago when they drifted apart, even if others would prefer them to remain silent. So yes, I'm hoping that one is going to be good. I have been sent a copy of this by Pushkin Press. This is one of their new Japanese novellas and it is called Harlequin Butterfly by To Enjo and it's translated from the Japanese by David Boyd. The reason I'm really intrigued by this one is because it is about translation and it's work in translation. And that reminds me of Banana Yoshimoto's NP, which is one of my favorite books by her. Granted, I haven't read it in a really long time, but I have such fond memories of it. But this is about an entrepreneur called A.A. A. Abrams, who is pursuing a writer who is really fascinated slash suspicious by, because this writer seems to move from country to country and write fluently in whatever language that country speaks and writes in. And they want to find out how this writer does it and quiz them about it, but they can never find them because the writer is always one step ahead. I think that sounds great. And then finally, for this part of the video, before we jump into the reading vlog segment, I have four books by Fairlight Moderns that I have been sent for review. Fairlight Moderns publish these pocket-sized books and I have enjoyed um, some of these that I've read in the past, especially The Therapist by Niall Giacomelli, which was one of my favourite books a couple of years ago. I thought it was brilliant. So because that was one of my favourite books of the year, I'm always really interested in seeing what stuff they have coming out. So we have Dancing in the Shallows by Claire Redaway, which is about a woman called Isla Wintergreen, which is the best name ever. It's set on the Isle of Skye. She has traveled back there because she's inherited a cottage and she starts to investigate and find out about her estranged family. A Good Year by Polis Aloizu is a book that is set in rural Cyprus in 1925 about a woman who is heavily pregnant and she's deeply afraid because the 12 days of Christmas are beginning, the time when, according to local folklore, creatures known are as Calacanzari come up from hell to wreak havoc. Is this the kind of book I want to be reading at the moment? I don't know. I kind of feel like maybe. <laughs> so yes, that one is on the TBR. Then we've got Voting Day by Claire O'Day, which is set in Switzerland in February 1959 when they held a referendum on women's suffrage and the men voted no. And I think that in this novel set in this real time, this real historical event, we're following four different women and how they reacted to that situation. And then we have got The Two-Tailed Snake by Nod Ghosh, which is set in Northeast India in 1945. It says tensions are rising, but 14-year-old Joya doesn't pay much attention to political business. She is more concerned with doing well at school and having fun with her best friends. Yet when her father disappears without a trace, her life falls apart. So those are all the new books that need to be shelved away on the bookcases. So I am going to pop those on the shelves now and I'm going to check in with you very soon, literally one second for you, to jump into the reading vlog segment of this video. So I'll see you in a moment. Hi, same seat, different day. Back in the day, several years ago, I made, I think, a series of videos where it wasn't read this book if you liked this book, but it was a bit similar. It was books that I suggested you read in pairs, books that complement each other in some form or another, such as Crow by Ted Hughes and Grief is a Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. And then more recently, I think in about 2020, I hauled these two books. And I'm pretty sure, if I'm remembering correctly, that in that haul video, I said I would quite like to read these books together at some point in the future. And that's because they're on very similar topics. So we have The Glass Town Game by Catherine M. Valenti. And then we have Glass Town by Isabel Greenberg. So Catherine M. Valenti is the author of The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making. More recently, 
something with apples. What is the title of that book? I will insert it on the screen here. A very short book. The name has just gone out of my brain. I'm sorry. Um, and lots of other books besides. She's really into mythology in particular. But this one, The Glass Town Game, is a novel about the Bronte siblings and this imaginary world that they created together called Glass Town. And then this one by Isabel Greenberg, which is just called Glass Town, is a graphic novel which explores that too. So they are both navigating the same territory, talking about the same historical figures and using extracts from their writings on Glass Town to create something new. And especially because these are in two, if I can lean back so you can see both of them at the same time, because these are in two completely separate formats, a novel and a graphic novel, I thought it could be interesting to read them side by side. It also potentially could be really annoying because you may feel like you're just reading the same thing. So I don't know if I'm gonna be reading both of them, in this vlog or just one of them. Initially I thought this was gonna be a video all of its own and then I thought that's not really enough for a whole video so I just thought I would include it as a segment. I decided to start with Isabel Greenberg's book. She is the author of A Hundred Nights of Hero and the Encyclopedia of Early Earth amongst other things and I absolutely adored this. I think primarily I loved it because of the art style and I'm going to do some cutaways here so you can see how beautiful both the colour palette is and just the art style in general. In this graphic novel we get a character from the fictional world of Glass Town, in inverted commas, come to life to speak to Charlotte Bronte later on in her life when she is the only Bronte sister or sibling still alive and he asks her if she would like to go back into the world that they created and, and relive it for our benefit as the reader but it does work as a premise. The world of Glastown and the characters that Anne Branwell, Emily and Anne created is a little bit chaotic but that's because it was created by children and spliced together by four different minds as well. I liked seeing why they created this world the stories that they told within the world itself, I wasn't hugely invested in because as I said, they were a bit chaotic and messy. It was more the whys. I liked hearing about how they used Glass Town as this form of escapism when they were experiencing grief in their lives. It was also something that they were able to write about when they were separated from each other, going to different schools. And there are definitely jokes to be made in here about how certain characters that the Brontes created could be seen mirrored in novels of theirs that they happened to write later. I think the format works so well for this. The way that Isabel has illustrated this makes it feel very childlike and I don't mean that in any kind of derogatory way, I mean that it captures that imagination in a really pure way. The colours that she uses helps to reflect the mood that the characters are in at any given time and allows for that surreal dreamlike quality which reflects their state of mind. So I would really really recommend this one. Having now finished this and looking at the Glass Town game, I am less sure as to whether or not this is a book I want to dive into right away, but I'm gonna read the beginning of it and see how I feel. So I will come back to you when I have done that. I also would like to make some crumpets, which I think I may have done in a reading vlog at some point on this channel before, but I only started making them for the first time this year. They were always something that I just bought otherwise but they are so easy to make. I will leave the recipe in the description box down below because I can't remember it off the top of my head but they're quite quick to make. You need to let the the dough rest for about 15 minutes, half an hour so that the yeast can activate but aside from that they take a couple of minutes to cook and then also to prep before you leave it to rest. So yes, I'm gonna go make some crumpets. I think I'm gonna have them with butter and honey, though I have also been meaning to make savory crumpets at some point with jalapenos and stuff, which I know you can do, but I think that might be for another time. I'm fancying something sweet today. So let's go make crumpets and then I'm gonna come back to you and talk to you about the Catherine and Valenti book and then we can jump into that quiz that I talked about at the beginning of this video too. 
I did say this video was going to be lots of different things, so we're sticking to that promise. I am back. I have decided that I am not going to read The Glass Town Game. Not saying I'm never going to read it, I'm just not going to pick it up now. As I mentioned in the last clip, it could either be really, really fun to read two books that explore similar themes, similar territory, or it could be potentially quite frustrating because you feel like you have just went to that place and you know these things, and maybe you don't need to do that twice in quick succession. When I've read pairs of books before, it's often been, say, a non-fiction book about a subject and then a novel that explores that subject. Maybe that is a more interesting way to pair books together, I'm not sure. With Catherine and Valenti's books, I have loved her the Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland books, or at least I really enjoyed the first couple in the series and then I didn't enjoy the rest in the series too much. But again, it's been a really long time since I read those. I think I read those the first year of Booktube, so that is 10 years ago now. And who knows how I would feel about them if I read them now. And then I haven't always loved other things by her that I've picked up. You have to really be in the mood to read her work, especially her middle grade stuff, because it's very earnest, which if you're, as I said, in the mood for that, that's really great. Kind of Alice in Wonderlandy, over the top tones. Um, and that can be quite cozy. The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making is super cozy. Also with this book, we really got off on the wrong foot because the first sentence frustrated me a lot. Let me read you the first sentence. <clears throat> Once four children called Charlotte, Emily, Anne and Branwell lived all together in a village called Haworth in the very farthest, steepest, highest, northernest bit of England. And I'm sorry, but this is where Haworth is. I don't know if she was just going for hyperbole, but it's just wrong. Um, and that I found very frustrating. I'm from Sunderland, but even I would say that I am not from the northernest part of England. And that's even taken into account the way that the border curves a bit. So, uh, yeah, no, that didn't endear me. But then as I continued reading, I thought, actually, I have just read this story in a different form and I don't need to revisit it right now. So I'm going to put this back on my shelf and we can maybe revisit it in the future another time. So I'm quite glad that I did not do <laughs> this pairing as its own reading vlog because it definitely works better as a segment, as it turns out. Right, I want to jump into the game that I mentioned at the very beginning of this video. This is a game for you and I would love you to take part and you can get any friends on board if you would like to or family members, but you can also just do it by yourself if that's what you would like to do. I did this a couple of years ago and I had a lot of fun creating the game. This is a different version of it. So if you played it last time, you still get to play it this time. I also do this every month over on Patreon, but there's no overlapping content from those posts either. Every month on Patreon, I do a bookish dingbat. We call them dingbats in the UK. I don't know if they're called that elsewhere, but essentially it's say what you see. So you'll see a picture and you have to work out what you're looking at 
say it and that will form, in this case, the title of a book. I will leave a link to a Google Doc in the description box down below for anyone who is visually impaired with image descriptions of the images that I'm going to show you. So if you're visually impaired, you can still play along, do not worry. I will give you an example. So here on the screen is an example. This is a book title. You have to say what you see. So we have a pin, we have the letter O, we have a key, and we have another letter O. So if you put that together, that would be pin O, key O, Pinocchio. The book Pinocchio, with some of the ones that I've made, you're gonna have to stretch it a bit. <laughs> you're gonna have to stretch and get inventive. Think of maybe other names for the image, which may not be the first thing that springs to mind. Um, and I have made 10 of these bookish dingbats, so 10 rounds. Each of them is gonna be on the screen for one minute. So you have up to a minute to guess your answer and write it down. And then at the end, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna give you all of the answers and you can score yourself. All of the books that I've picked are old, well-known books. So it's no recent titles, mostly classics. Shall we just dive in? Good luck everyone. And I will see you at the end of these 10 minutes. On your marks, get well, go grab a pen and a piece of paper, maybe pause this video, and then once you have those things, on your marks, get set, go. I nearly said bake. This is not bake off.
how do you think you got on? How do you think you did? I got Mr. M to go through these and try and guess them and he groaned a lot at some of them. <laughs> so I'm sorry if some of these make you groan, but let's go through the answers together. I've got my computer in front of me so that I can remind myself of what I did. So number one, we had someone holding a sign that said au revoir and then we have a bell. This was by bell, so the Bible. Number two, we had four images. We had the letter nine. We had a copy of Teen Vogue. We had a girl eating cereal, I think she's eating, and the book Eeyore's Birthday. So with this one, I guess it was more, what are you supposed to pick from each image and play around with it until you get a title. So this is nine, teen, eight, Eeyore. This was one of the ones that made Mr. M groan. <laughs> so 1980. Four. Number three, we have a bride, we have some doll, we have the letter A and we have a sign that says this way pointing to the right. So this is not bride, this is one of those images where you had to guess which version of the thing you are seeing is the right one. So it's not bride, it's Mrs. So Mrs. Dull -a way, Mrs. Dullaway by Virginia Woolf. Next up, we have Frodo, and he's got his, his ring. And then we have an aeroplane. This one was Lord of the Flies. Number five, this was another one that made uh, Mr. M roll his eyes. We have a square that is in the color gray. We have the new logo for Twitter, so X. We have a woodpecker, and we have a train in a train station. So this was gray, X, peck, station. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Number six, we have a packet of Starburst Ice Lollies. And then we have um, a sign that says, thank you. So the first image, the word for that one was lolly. And then another word for thank you in England, in the UK is tar. So lolita. I'm sorry if you're not from the UK and you have never heard the word tar before, as in shorthand for thanks, but lolita. Number seven, we have two women who are whispering to each other. We have a cat who is hissing, and then we have three political rosettes. We've got a rosette for Liberal Democrats, one for Labour and one for Conservatives, and we've got an arrow that's pointing to Conservatives. So the first image, it's not gossip that we're looking for, it's secret. The cat is hissing and then the term for conservatives in the UK, and again apologies if you did not know this, if you're not from the UK, is the Tory party. So we have the secret hiss Tory. The secret history by Donna Tartt. Next, number eight, we have a bee, we have an eel, we have a street with autumn leaves and stuff, and then we have a cartoon of someone speaking or talking. This is if Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. Number nine, we have a sick emoji. Someone is ill, it's a green face with a hot water bottle or an ice pack on their head and a thermometer in their mouth. We have the logo for EE, which is a phone company. And then we have a billboard that says your ad here. So this one was ill, not sick. So ill, E, ad, Iliad. And then the final one, we have number 10, is an arrow that is pointing to the right. And then underneath we have a stained glass window of Adam and Eve and the serpent and the apple tree. So this was not right, but east. And then the second image is Eden. So East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I would love to know how you did. How many out of 10 did you guess? Let me know in a comment down below and as I said I do these over on Patreon every month that's the tier that everybody has access to it's just an extra little thing so if you want more of those you can head over to Patreon for that and then I will also link the previous video that I did on this channel a couple of years ago if you would like to play that one as well. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. If you're new to my channel and you liked it and you would like to subscribe, that would be lovely. If you enjoy my content and if you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that'd be very kind. Patreon is a place where you can tip creators and the support that I receive over there allows me to keep creating free content on here and also funds my time making it accessible by creating captions and all of that 
good stuff. Let me know how you are, I would love to know, and I hope that you have a lovely festive period, whatever you happen to be doing. It's a very quiet one for us here, um, but I am looking forward to it, some downtime, some food, and um, I don't know what else, but we'll figure it out. I'm sending lots of love to you all, and I will see you for another video next Sunday on New Year's Eve. So I will see you then. Sending lots of love. Bye.